Welcome to Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. Our guest today is Professor Dominic Homburger. She's an alumni professor at the Department of Biological Sciences at Louisiana State University. She's an expert in comparative anatomy with a specialization on parrots. Dr. Homburger is the current president of the International Ornithological Union. She has been coming to India since 1972. She first came as a student under Project Tiger and then has returned to India frequently. Welcome, Dr. Homburger. Thank you, Shobha, very much for this kind introduction and especially for your kind invitation to give an interview to your series. I have seen the series. I'm very impressed by it. So thank you very much. Dr. Homburger, you have been in India in your latest trip for about two months? Yes. Um, this time I'm on sabbatical, which allows me to travel and to not to teach. And so we decided to be here for two months in India. And it has been very interesting because I'm returning to India after 10 years. And where did you go this time? Well, we were able to travel widely. So we arrived in mid-October in Mumbai. And uh, I was very lucky. We had um, a guest apartment at uh, TFI, TIFR. TIFR. And um, on the sixth floor, which allowed me to observe the Alexandrine parrot uh, feeding and uh, courtship, uh, doing courtship. Uh, in the Indian almonds, the Terminalia kappa, which was extremely good, and I have some very good observations. Uh, In between, we went to Pune, and I had the the opportunity to meet with some colleagues and travel into the villages and the uh, national parks of the uh, Western Ghats. We returned to Bombay and went then to Bangalore, where we stayed for three weeks. And from there, um, in Bangalore at RRI, I watched the rose-ringed parrot uh, from uh, their behaviors at the nesting site. Okay. So that was very interesting and what they were feeding. And then we went to Chennai for a few days, from there to Kolkata for a few days. And most recently, we just returned from a trip to Darjeeling and going all the way up to the mountains at uh, 3,600 meters at Sandakpu. So I have been able, I'm very glad, to look at birds in various regions. Yes, yes. So we will come, the bulk of this interview will be about your research on parrots, but I wanted to ask how you became interested in birds in the first place? Well, I grew up with lots of pets, including budgies and uh, lovebirds and uh, various mammals and reptiles. And I first wanted to become a veterinarian, but uh, I had been told that as a woman I can't really become a zoo veterinarian uh, because these places needed to be reserved for men. And Mm. so I decided to uh, become a biologist. And I'm very glad I did switch because uh, I love to be a biologist. It's very interesting. I love to do research. And so when I switched, a professor noticed that I had this background in animal physiology and anatomy. And he invited me to do a dissertation with him, a doctoral dissertation. And he he told me, well, we really don't know anything about the evolution of parrots. Why don't you do a dissertation on it? And so I did do all kinds of research. And four years later, he asked me, are you done? And I said, yes. And And this is how I started. (laughs) Anyone who talks about you uh, mentions two words, evolution and complex. So the bulk of, I looked it up, and the bulk of your research is on how complex systems can evolve further while remaining functional at all (laughs) stages as per your website. Can you break it down for us, for an amateur audience? What does this mean with respect to birds? 
Well, yes, actually, um, birds evolve just like other animals. And you are very good. You, you <laughs> picked up exactly my specialty. In some ways, what it is, is really evolution is not what most people think, namely the survival of the fittest or optimization or any of these things. Evolution is really an interaction between uh, a bird, as an example, and its environment. And depending on how the bird will interact with the environment, that bird will survive or not to reproduce. Now, that bird doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be good enough. Mm -hmm. I always tell my students, you, you don't need to be perfect. You just need to be good enough. The important thing for evolution is that we always deal with a population. And within the population, the individuals are variable. So depending on the environment, one individual may do better than another individual. But the environment constantly changes. Absolutely. And so, therefore, it's never a single individual that does much better than all others. It just changes depending on the environment. So what I'm hearing is, is a, co a complex dance yes. with adaptability. Absolutely. You say it very well. And um, can you give... Um, so, okay, let's talk. Uh, I'm looking for specific examples, one of which you talk about is beaks. Well, yes. So when I did my dissertation in Switzerland, I was able to look at many parrot species in um, aviaries of amateurs. And what I wanted to know is how do the parrots eat? And I discovered rather quickly that irrespective of the beak shape, they all ate by shelling seeds. And so I came up with the concept that beaks are more like a Swiss army knife. They do everything. It's feeding, it's drinking, it's feeding the young, climbing, fighting. Climbing too. Climbing too in parrots, absolutely. And uh, this is why their hooked bills is quite adapted mm. to climbing. Uh, especially here in India, you see the rosering parrots sometimes climbing the walls of buildings or the smooth bark of palm trees. So, and so really, again, we don't talk about optimizing the beak, but just making it good enough to do all the tasks that it needs to do. So if the environment is full of very hard nuts, then the beak will be a little bit shorter to have greater force to crack the nuts. But if the environment is full of fruits and the parrot is adapted to eating fruit, like the hanging parrot, yes. uh, we, the vernal, vernal hanging, hanging parrot, parrot yes. then the beak is longer and thinner so that it can widen um, its gape and grab the fruit. Mm. So we have variations that are adaptive to particular environments but the beak can still do everything. Mm. In your lecture at NCBS, you talked about the high for, uh, high oil, high oil yes, substance. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, what is that? I, uh, well, this is something interesting. I will have to um, reach a little bit farther back to explain to you. Um, it's, um, I would start with the anatomy of humans. Mm. And uh, we all know we have a very soft malleable tongue that can uh, assume all kinds of shapes. And um, that evolved because we are mammals. And as babies, we need to be able to create uh, a void around the nipple of the mother's breast in order to suck, extract the milk from the, the mother's breast. And for that, this malleable tongue can uh, create a vacuum yes, and then Pull. drink the milk. But in order to do that, um, the tongue has to be suspended directly to the skull. Yes. And that actually uh, restricts the entrance to the esophagus. Mm -hmm. okay? And uh, we humans are very prone 
to suffocating and uh, swallowing the wrong way. Mm -hmm. This is why we should not speak while we eat. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Our muscles were right, you know. <laughs> and um, so that necessitated for most mammals to have teeth and a, and a dentition so that they can masticate the food so that it is easier to swallow. In birds, we have a very different system. Uh, the tongue is supported by a skeleton mm -hmm. and a hyoid. And the hyoid is not directly attached to the skull, but is suspended within connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And so that tongue can move much more freely and can even move away from the palate. You probably have seen in some nature movies herons that can swallow entire fish. Yes. You know, and uh, even big fish, and it goes down the throat without yes. any problem because the tongue can move aside. Um, mammals cannot do that. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, the other aspect of your research is about avian vocalization. Again, I pull out a section from one of your research papers, and you talk about the fundamental roles of a kinetic larynx, air sacs, and the skin in avian vocalization. Again, unpack <laughs> this for us. <laughs> You're very good. Um, again, the easiest way to understand uh, what birds are doing is to go back to human anatomy and um, humans have a larynx or a voice box with uh, vocal folds. And uh, when we speak or sing, um, these vocal folds are es essentially clapping. They are opening and closing very fast. The faster they clap, open and close, the higher the sound. And the lower they clap, the lower the sound. And that is well known, and we can then sing and speak and all kinds of things. Birds, again, are completely different. Uh, birds uh, produce a sound uh, at the bottom of their throat in the syrinx. This is a special organ that only birds have. And then that sound moves up the air tube or the... The air tube. The air tube. Yes. And meets the larynx. Mm. The larynx is always very important because it closes when the food is swallowed so that the food doesn't get into the lungs. And however, in birds, the larynx can assume different shapes. Huh. And because it does so, in some birds, this would be songbirds and parrots, it resonates the sound that is produced. Hmm. And in this way, um, they can sing and produce different sounds. And in parrots and some songbirds, they can even imitate human speech. When you say resonates, does, do you mean like an echo chamber? Does it make yeah. it louder? Or? You know, it's very important even when um, we speak as human beings, the sound is produced in the larynx. But then it is so-called filtered mm -hmm. through our mouth cavity. Depending on the shape of our mouth cavity, the sound will be different. Mm -hmm. And this is called articulation. And this is why we can speak. We can say A, ah, O, oh, U, oh, and, you know, all, all the this. different sounds. And uh, we know that when we speak, we move the jaw yes. and the tongue. And um, to really see how important articulation is, is for you to try to speak without moving the jaw and the tongue. <laughs> Impossible almost. Impossible. It yes. simply makes one sound. Yes. And uh, in birds, that articulation is being done inside the larynx. Ah, okay. Okay. Some birds, at least in my neighborhood, we have, uh, I, we have, I have barbets that uh, articulate or you can hear them without the mouth opening, isn't it? Well, yes, because their songs are not very complicated. Yes, yes. You know, so they can keep the beak open and then create the sound in the syrinx deep down uh, at the beginning of their uh, thorax, mm. and they don't articulate very much. Mm. It's kind of a tick. You, you think of the coppersmith? 
Yeah, um, it's the brown-headed. Uh, uh, yes, a brown-headed too. Yes, yeah, yes. it's a relatively simple, simple sound. sound. Yes, very beautiful. But yes, <laughs> um, talk about um, feathers. For example, um, uh, you talk in one of your papers. There was this complex dance between thermal <laughs> insulation and aerial locomotion with respect to the evolution of feathers. All of us, kind of as birders, we kind of intuit that, but. I, I think you explain it so beautifully, and can you break it down for a amateur audience? What is that? Yeah, you know, we humans are extremely visually oriented, yes. and uh, birds too. We have this in common, and it's probably because of our ancestry, way back, uh, that uh, we lived in trees, and if we live in trees, we need to be able to have a three-dimensional vision. So that to know that when we jump from one branch to the other, we need to know exactly the depth, the width, the height, everything. And so the ancestors of birds that are arboreal uh, lizards and the ancestors of humans that are arboreal primates had to have this kind of vision. And so this is, I think, the reason why we humans uh, feel an affinity with birds and become bird watchers. But there are very few mammal watchers. Yes. Okay. <laughs> because uh, mammals are very different. They are mostly nocturnal and so on. But, yes. And so um, when we do uh, bird watching, then we do look at two characters um, to identify bird species. One, of course, is color and yes. shape because we are visually oriented. And then if bird watchers are more... Advanced, and I'm not, <laughs> but I know that there are some bird watchers and they are very good. Uh, they identify the bird species by sound. Yes. And that's for me looks almost like a miracle, you know, but they hear a sound far away and they say, This is that and that species. Um, but if we go back to the visual aspect, and these are the feathers, and most people look at colors, you know. But uh, what I became interested in is really why do birds have this um, uh, plumage? And it's not only colors, but the plumage has many other functions. And one, of course, is insulation. So many people think that insulation is for heat insulation. But paradoxically, most birds have too much. Hmm. It's like us wearing always a sweater. Oh. If we are in cold conditions, it's a very good thing. But if we exercise, for instance, then a sweater is really not very good. And that is really the problem that birds have. When they fly, it's very high exercise mm. that produces a lot of heat. And so birds in general, their problem is to be able to release heat as much as possible. And they do this through their beak that is in front, and it is very vascularized and can lose a lot of heat, all through the feet. And then underneath the wing, they also have some bare skin patch, and all that helps to regulate the, the heat. If it is very cold, you may have seen, maybe in Bangalore, although it's not very cold here, mm -hmm. but um, if they sleep and it is cool, they tuck their beak into their plumage. Yes. Okay. Because this is where they would lose the heat. Mm. So most people think that uh, feathers have bec uh, have evolved in order to, to insulate. insulate. But you're saying. But it's really uh, there is a problem with this hypothesis. So then I looked a little bit further, and I realized that all birds essentially are fusiform or aerodynamically. Uh, spindle shaped hmm. the body not the wing but the body and uh, you know ostriches are not but then they I realized they don't need to fly yes so birds when they want to fly this is really what was important because this aerodynamical uh, profile uh, reduces the drag and therefore less energy is needed to fly so then I looked a little bit more into it, and I saw more and more support for the idea that the flight of bird is based on an 
aerodynamically shaped body. Hmm. So then, how do feathers do that? And of course, we know when we buy a chicken in the market, it's not aerodynamically shaped at all. So this aerodynamical shape is completely dependent on the plumage. Hmm. So then, you know, there is always one insight and then the next question is um, really when there is a lot of wind, you see sometimes that the feathers are ruffled. Yes. And of course, if the feathers are ruffled, then cold air could reach the skin. Skin, okay. So how do birds prevent the ruffling of feathers also when they fly? And this is when I discovered that they have a very complicated feather musculature that allows the feathers to be raised. When it is cold, they can all fluff up. Or during courtship or fighting, you know, they fluff up to look bigger. Mm-hmm. Or they can uh, f- flatten their feathers so that the wind doesn't penetrate and that they keep an aerodynamic shape while flying. Hmm. Because while flying, there are lots of turbulences. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want the feathers Mm -hmm. to become ruffled because that again would increase the drag. Mm. So what I'm hearing is that feathers are almost like overkill for a bird because they have more than they need. They have it like they have it as a sweater. Yeah. For if you look only at insulation. If you look at it. And you are right that all characters of animals are more than what they need under normal circumstances, okay? But then, when there are exceptional circumstances, then really selection comes in. Hmm. You know, do they have this additional reserve Hmm. to survive the exceptional circumstances or not? And this is, of course, where selection comes in and uh, changes to adapt more to the environment. So the bar-headed geese is a a sort of resonant bird for me because it flies great heights and it also visits India. So just using that as an example, I guess the feathers it would need, uh, the ruffling would happen when it flies over the Himalayas or... um, It will not because it has its muscles. Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, since you mentioned that, I was very happy uh, just a few days ago to see... The the vulture, Mm. the griffin vulture, Mm. uh, flying three, kind of gliding and circling Mm. over Sandakpu. And uh, I was very glad to see that India still has some vultures because I know about the tragedy that we lost most vultures. You know, even in 86, I was always very happy uh, driving past uh, garbage heaps because it was full of... Vultures. Yes. And vultures are wonderful birds. Mm. So for vultures to soar at high, at great heights where there are lots of wind Mm. and turbulences, to be able to uh, soar without moving their wings, that's exactly where the muscles of the feathers come in to... um, to hold down the feathers Mm -hmm. towards the skin Mm -hmm. or to raise them a little bit. Mm. So this is like, um, I compare this to the system to a stealth airplane. Yes. That is covered with sensors. Mm. And each sensor then can uh, adjust the surface Mm. of that airplane Mm. according to what is needed. Mm. Okay. Um, That's great. (laughs) You talk a lot about microevolution and macroevolution. And um, can you relate that to avian research, your avian research? Again, you know, uh, bird research is just uh, an example. And so evolution is a principle. And it works on birds yes. or on worms or on snakes. Of <laughs> course. You know? And so, but your question is very well taken. Um, we have. Uh, In various countries, uh, there are groups of people who don't believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, my point is really I don't blame them uh, because I feel it is the job of biologists to explain evolution so that people can understand it. 
it's a relatively complicated theory. So as you say, it needs to be broken down. So with microevolution, this is something that probably everybody now agrees. This would be the change to change of organisms to changing environments. One example that we all know is using the use of pesticides. Mm. And as we create an environment with pesticides, at the beginning, many insects die, but not all of them. Some very strong individuals will survive, mm -hmm. and they will continue to breed and to um, increase in numbers. And so with time, the pesticides that we use is not useful anymore mm. because the insects have adapted to it. Mm -hmm. So then we use another stronger pesticides, and again, the insects will adapt to it, and so on and so on. And uh, today, we are really at a stage where we use pesticides against insects that are so strong that they also affect people. So we really need to think about that. Another example of microevolution is the use of antibiotics that we have selected through the antibiotics for stronger and stronger bacteria. Mm -hmm. And today we have, I think especially also in India, we have the problem of antibiotic resistant tuberculosis. Yes. And that's a big problem uh, for all over the world because tuberculosis is a terrible disease. So I think in microevolution, this is not a problem. Even people who don't believe in evolution concede yes. that they understand that. Yes. And where the problem comes in is when we look at the evolution of elephants or of buffaloes. And uh, you know that our uh, large animals and very different from fossils. And then people say, sure, I understand microevolution, but how could a buffalo evolve from dinosaurs? You know, this kind of thing. And they said, of course, this is not how it happened. No. So the best model to see how macroevolution works, and already Darwin did that, is to look at domestication. And so what, it's simply a model. This is not how it happened in nature. In nature, it simply takes much longer time. But domestication, everybody understands. You know, we know, for instance, that um, the ancestor of dogs are wolves. But I have seen lots of Indian dogs, and they have short legs and long legs, and white, black, all kinds of things. And this has been achieved by selecting um, particular um, what you do, dogs that look pleasant. Mm -hmm. And so with time, the domesticated dogs look very different mm. from the wolf. You know, I have seen these little white, um, tiny yes. dogs, yes. you know, they look very cute. Yes. And I, you, you would think this is a different species, yes. you know, they, they have nothing in common with a wolf. And yet we were able to do this in relatively short time because human selection is very strong. Yes. Okay. And so um, this is how we have to conceptualize macroevolution, the evolution of very different animals, such as rhinoceroses and elephants. They are mammals, but they are very different. Uh, they look very different and live in very different times. But we had millions of years mm. to create these differences. Yes. So that's the c c the dance between micro and macro yes, evolution. Yes. Yes. Um, how um, you talked about Go Gondwana land. That is yes. another. I, I, and the origins of birds and the evolution of birds and their respect to Gondwana land. That's fascinating. Can you touch upon that with a couple of examples of birds and how? they are found in different parts. Yes. yes. I, I love to talk about that because now we can go back to parrots. Mm. <laughs> because um, parrots are distributed widely all across the southern okay. hemisphere. The southern hemisphere are all these southern yes. continents yes. that uh, up to 65 million years ago, they were all together in a supercontinent mm. called Gondwana. And then 65 million years ago, for some reason, um, the southern continent started to move apart. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, kind of moving apart and moved towards the equator in the north. 
But parrots were all over that Gondwanian um, continent. And so when the continents, the southern continents, uh, spread apart, the, they took the parrots with them. Mm. And so we have the Australian parrots and cockatoos mm -hmm. that are very different from the South American ones or the African ones or the ones in Fiji, mm. which is also part of Gondwana or New Caledonia and including India. Mm -hmm. And so it's really like these continents were like a boat. They had already the animals on them and the plants. And then because they were separated from each other, they evolved independently. And so I have been traveling the world to, see, to look at parrots in their natural environment on different continents. So they all are parrots, easily recognizable as parrots, but they have specialized to different environments. So one of my interests coming to India was that India should be part of Gondwana and we should have science that reflects it. But surprisingly enough, there is almost no research being done on parrots or in, on plants in India relative to the plants and parrots on other continents. Mm. Mm. So in my talks, and you may have heard it, you know, I said um, that um, if we want to understand the remnants of Gondwana in the different continents, we would have to go to environments mm. that are still similar to what was in Gondwana. Gondwana had uh, uh, temperate rainforests, cool, but rainforests. And so if we want to see remnants of plants and parrots in other continents, we have to go to these environments. And some of these environments are the Western Ghats, but also the Eastern Ghats. And um, I was very lucky, as I told before, to be in the Western Ghats. And uh, it's quite clear that more research should be done, and especially the Western and Eastern Ghats should be preserved. Mm. It's a high priority because research on the plants and animals, fish, uh, a colleague of mine at um, Modern College in Pune is specializing on fish in the Western Ghats. All these have uh, connections to fish and other uh, animals on other Gondwanian mm. Uh, continents, but almost nothing is done in India. Mm. And I would very much like to encourage uh, Indian scientists to do research in, uh, with this in mind, because that would be, um, the Indian scientists would have no competition. Yes, you, you know? in fact offered your help to <laughs> yes. any students at N NCW. Absolutely. Very yeah. rash offer. <laughs> and uh, it was very interesting. The students immediately pick up On it. that idea. And, uh, you know, it's nice to do research that connects to other people doing similar research, but not the same. Yes. So you can do your own research, but it is uh, embedded in a bigger concept. Professor Hamburger, this is a tough question, but for listeners who um, know you as an expert on parrot research, but really don't know the details, what are some takeaways that you have found about in all your research on parrots? What are a few things that an amateur bird watcher would find interesting about this species? Yeah, you know, that because in my research, of course, I needed to know uh, everything about the lives of parrots, not only feeding, you know, uh, to understand how they interact with the environment. So the lessons about parrots, I think, foremost is that they are highly intelligent birds, probably the most intelligent birds. Uh, I would say they are more intelligent than the crows. Corvids. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, they definitely are. And they are very highly social animals. So keeping a parrot as a pet in a cage is really akin to keep a human in solitary confinement. We know about humans that solitary confinement is, uh, creates worst. deep psychological trauma. Mm. 
And we see that also with parrots. Mm. Many parrots become uh, very neurotic uh, when they are kept alone in a cage. Uh, one of the um, results of their being kept alone in a cage is that they often start to speak. Mm. And Quote humans unquote. are all delighted, you know, this is great, you know, such an animal. And the problem is actually that um, the reason for that is actually rather sad because uh, a parrot kept sing uh, single in a cage, of course, needs company, wants to contact with another being. And so they observe the people around it and they realize that people are communicating and so they imitate hmm. that speech. And then, of course, they get rewarded by people coming and say, oh, this is great, you know, mm. and they bring food and so on, and they interact with the parrot. And I say very often, parrots in some ways are more intelligent than humans mm. because they can learn human speech. Mm. Humans cannot learn parrot speech. Because of that, we do tremendous harm to parrots. So in many ways, parrots should never be kept in captivity, except perhaps uh, budgies, and lovebirds and cockatiels that have been domesticated for 150 years. So they are like chickens, mm. you know. Still, they should never be kept alone. So that's takeaway number one. Don't that's takeaway number one, okay. Yeah. The other thing uh, that we need to think about is that um, parrots are cavity breeders, okay? What does that mean? Oh, yeah, they cavity breeders. Cavity breeders. They yeah. breed in cavities yes. of trees. Mm. And sometimes in cavities in rocks or in human buildings. Mm -hmm. We see this with rose-ringed parakeets, mm -hmm. that sometimes they get into some uh, nook in, in a house and breed there. But uh, most parrots breed in tree cavities. And tree cavities, uh, they need to be natural. They don't excavate them. And so they are found in old trees. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem now for parrots is that humans are cutting down trees. Mm. So small trees are of no use. The big trees are absolutely necessary. Um, and yet, all over the place, especially in Bangalore, I have seen uh, trees are being cut left and right. Yes. And that creates, of course, a problem because they can't reproduce. Mm. So all yeah. the tree huggers of Bangalore or all over India sh saving old trees is a good thing for parrots for everybody for everybody <laughs> <laughs> for, for people too <laughs> for the earth <laughs> you know and uh, it's interesting that we call them tree huggers or conservationists actually these are the people who are doing the right thing yes I say it as a compliment. Yeah, yeah I know that. <laughs> but the non-tree huggers are yes. actually the problems, yes. you know. Yes. Yeah, I know you meant as a problem, yeah. as a compliment, of course. So the cavity breeders preserve old trees. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And even dead trees, because then uh, they start to rot and they have cavities in them and they just put a, provide cavities for birds to breed. Um, there was another thing that was uh, important. Um, Cavity breeders is... Um, and they're highly sociable. Uh, highly sociable. And um, another thing is that um, urban parrots, or parrots that become urban, is almost like a canary in the mine. I don't know whether you know that concept. Um, miners um, in England um, kept canaries, these are little finches, in cages because when you go into a mine, there is sometimes carbon monoxide that doesn't smell differently and is deadly. And so they kept this little bird with them because that bird would die, die. first. So the concept of a canary in the coal, coal mine. mine is really um, indicators it's of dangers. Yes. So when we have uh, parrots in urban places, it really is an indicator that their natural environment is being destroyed. Mm. And there's an example that I just heard from birders here in Bangalore is that they have started to see Malabar parakeets in the vicinity of Bangalore. And uh, they were very happy because mm. it's another species. Mm. 
I, in contrast, was rather po horrified because it means that the natural environment of the Malabar parakeet in the southern western Ghats obviously is being destroyed. And so parrots being very intelligent, they simply look for another environment where they find food. I get what you're saying, but just to push back a little yes. bit. Yes. What, so maybe they are highly adaptable and they will adapt to the outskirts of Bangalore, uh, these Malabar parakeets, and so they will survive. So what is wrong with that? Uh, you know, it's, it's nothing wrong when we just look at parrots in isolation. Hmm. But um, as a scientist, and I think all birders also should look at it like this, is to look at parrots within the context of the environment uh, of the entire region and ultimately of the environment for people. So if we destroy the environment of the Malabar parakeet in the Western Ghats, it's not only the Malabar parakeet that will suffer, it will be all the other anim animals, but I would also say uh, it will hurt people because uh, when I um, see people in villages that are kind of embedded in the natural environment with small buildings, you know, gardens, um, peace and quiet, mm -hmm. <laughs> and all that. It's a, it's a very nice environment for people. Mm -hmm. They may not be terribly rich, but it's a very nice, peaceful, supportive environment for people. And if I compare this to some places in Indian cities, I'm not I sure. See. I see what you're saying. So for the Malabar parakeet, the forest is the beautiful garden and the small yes. house. And here it is adapting, but it's not good. Well, it's, uh, I really see sometimes there are environments for people that are really not good and people try to get out of it, but they can't because yes. of poverty and so on. Yes. So I think when we look at animals and the environment, it really teaches us also about the environment for people. Yes. For urban birders in India, the rose-ring parakeet is the most common species that we see, and we see it all the time. But can you shed light on that as a species? You say one of the lyrical things in, you said in your talk was you can have a great life sitting in your balcony, watching the par parakeets, having lunch, watch the parakeets. So what am I looking for? I see them every day. Yeah, you see, just seeing them... Um, there are so many things that one can study. For instance, when do they start to do courtship in the year? How long does it take until the female disappears into a nesting hole? And then how often does the male come and go be because he has to feed the female that is incubating the eggs? And so for a long time, you see just the male going back and forth. And sometimes when it is hot, you see the female coming out and just sitting next to the nesting hole. Mm. And then you can see how long does it take until um, the eggs are fledging. Mm. One of the indications is that very soon the female has to go back and forth and mm. bring food for the entire brood of nestlings. Mm. It's not enough for the male to bring that. And then you can see when do the nestlings come out of the hole because there will be larger ones and smaller ones. You can count how many do that and so on. You constantly can see something. I can tell you about some of the things that I have learned is because I have a camera that is powerful in uh, zooming so that you can magnify things and see far away. And it's a tiny camera that I can simply put into my uh, pocket. Uh, the pictures are not for uh, National Geographic. It's not of that <laughs> quality, but it, it gives the data. And I saw two parrots, you know, four parrots and two parrots fighting. And I immediately thought, yeah, of course, these are the males fighting. But then... I this was in India? It was in India, in, in uh, Bombay. Hmm. Uh, of rose-ringed parrots, uh, parakeets. No, of Alexandrine parakeets. This is what I saw. And so these two were fighting viciously. And I took a video and then put the video on my computer, that, which would enlarge the image. And to my big surprise, there were two females fighting. I didn't expect this at all. 
So I was starting to think, why would females fight? Usually the males are fighting. And then I realized they are fighting for the scarce nesting holes. Mm. Okay? Because they need to lay their eggs, mm. they probably are ready to do so, mm. and probably there was only one nesting hole. So the females are fighting. So these are these little discoveries that one can do by simply sitting there and watching and kind of looking at these birds in their social behavior, in what they eat, what they like to eat. Mm. So, for instance, I saw that the Alexandrine parakeets that are larger, with larger beaks, they can crack open the Indian almond, the Terminalia kappa. But they have to work very hard on that. They first have to strip all the soft tissue around it, and then finally they see where there is the seam mm -hmm. of the nut, and they crack it, and then the, the almond comes out, and it is yes. a very large relative to their body size. Yes. But the rosewing parakeet cannot do that, yes. because the beak is smaller. Yes. But then I saw them feeding on the unripe seeds of the coral African acacia. tulip tree. Uh, or no. No. The, it's an acacia okay. that has these long, long yes. beans, yes. and eventually the beans inside become uh, red. Hmm. I but know the one you're talking about. You know, hmm. they are very common. Hmm. And, um, but the parrots eat them when they are still green. Hmm. And they know how to open the beans, the long beans, and then they take one of the little beans out and eat only what is inside. Mm. And I didn't know that before. But by sitting under a tree where I saw the parakeet, I saw what they dropped, mm. and I saw what they are doing, and so now I know they eat that. But clearly throughout the year, they will eat different things, mm. and we really don't know that. Mm. One of the things that I see is the speed at which they fly, these rosering parakeets, and they shriek as they fly, yeah. and then how quickly they are able to navigate and come quickly and sit on it. So again, anything that you can say about the speed of their flight and the, the shrieking when they fly. Yeah, the shrieking are contact calls. Mm. It's kind of, I'm here. Mm. You know, it's almost like uh, blowing the horn in cars, you know. Yes. I'm here, yes. and uh, please come, and, and these kind of things, because it's difficult to follow um, flying birds because they do so in three-dimensional space. Mm. So these are contact calls. Mm. Uh, there are, of course, also other sounds that they do. I have recorded, for instance, a rose ring parakeet warbling. And they, it's kind of like talking and so on. And uh, it was a female sitting next to the nesting hole. I'd never heard this before. I was very glad I was able to tape it. So these are these new discoveries that we can all do with a very common bird. Mm -hmm. And then eventually... We understand much more about their family life, their social life, how they reproduce, their and interactions. And they spread their wings when they sort of make the landing. Yes, on they the need to do that. This is a very good observation that you do because a big problem is when they fly so fast, if they were simply landing instantaneously, it would hit much too strongly and they might bounce back. So they need to reduce their speed, and it's almost like hang gliders or parachutes mm. that, um, you know, they spread their wings to increase the drag mm. and therefore slow down mm. and be able to land exactly where they would need to land. To take from what you said earlier about the contact calls, can we say that all birds that fly in groups have these contact calls, but because others don't or not really? No, we can't generalize so much. Hmm. Um, for instance, you have uh, starlings. I'm not sure whether you have starlings here, but there must well, be. Or weaver birds hmm. that fly in big flocks, hmm. almost like clouds. Hmm. And uh, I don't think they make a lot of contact calls. Mm. Uh, the noise you hear is because of the wings. Mm. Uh, they feel each other more. 
and therefore they fly in a coordinated way. Okay. You know? Yeah. So so the swifts, I've heard them. Yes, they too. Yes, they absolutely. Do. You're a very good bird. You are a bird, aren't you? <laughs> you watch. Yes, excellent. Thank you. And uh, again, the swifts can be observed inside the city, you know. Where do they breed? How many people? How many birds? One of the things that I noticed with uh, rose-ring parakeets is that they are more than just the, the male and the female near the nest. And I don't understand that. There were other females that go to the nest and look inside, and then they leave again. And, of course, my observations were limited, because I do have to do other work. But somebody who is here, uh, a citizen scientist, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, a birder, mm -hmm. that's exactly uh, something very re rewarding that can be done. Yes. You know, to... Uh, start to look at individuals. I recognized, for instance, a breeding female because her tail was crooked. Mm. And the other females had still a straight tail because they didn't go into the cavity. Mm. And so you can start to individualize the birds mm. and see which ones interact with each other and what are they doing. Mm. And that creates really a deeper understanding of how parrots uh, interact. We really need more such work hmm. um, that citizen scientists can do. Instead of just looking at birds, you really start to understand the birds. And once we know more about their social behavior, or their family life, um, it's easier to tell this story and to bring out emotions of regular people. Mm. They look they are families like you have, mm. you know. Uh, they need a home like you have. And so that uh, people who are not birders uh, start to empathize. Yes. Because it's all about empathy. Professor Homburger, I have three questions, and that's the last of it. You have been coming to India since 1972. I would like your impressions of how the country and nature in India has changed. Or parrots. <laughs> yes, this is a very um, challenging question, but I think it is very important that you asked it, and um, I thank you for that. Um, of course, coming from the outside, I'm very uh, careful about being critical, and so my impressions have always been uh, double-checked by my talking to Indian scientists. And so when I came in '72. Of course, India was a very different uh, country. It was just after the war in 71, and uh, there were bad harvests, and so this was a very difficult time for India. But at that time, we had half the population, the half the human population. So I have been able to witness the doubling of the human population in India. And I can tell you, that it really shows. And especially after having been away from India for 10 years and coming back now, uh, it gives me the perspective to see the change in only 10 years. Uh, one of the things is really that the environment has tremendously deteriorated. Uh, where there were fields and agricultural land with birds in them, today we have um, concrete buildings. And um, I understand, uh, twice the population needs twice the habitation. Yeah, people need to have shelter. And these are uh, buildings that humans build. But I have also seen that entire mountains between Mysore and Bangalore have disappeared. I, I was looking for them. They are gone. And as you go to the airport, uh, the next mountain is about to disappear. And uh, the air is, of course, not very good. And so what we are seeing here is that we are replacing nature in India that is very rich and very beautiful. We are replacing it by concrete jungles. And it's not necessarily a nice environment for people. And it's simply a result of having to provide uh, habitation for the exploding human population. 
I call this actually a human tsunami. And I see that this human tsunami doesn't destroy only the natural environment, but also the beautiful cities that India had. And an example is Mysore, that was this kind of beautiful, uh, grown, cultural environment that has essentially disappeared. Yeah. So today I wouldn't tell people to come to Mysore to see a beautiful city. Uh, the old houses have been raised and replaced by neutral things. And so um, a concept that I heard from Indian scientists is anthropogenic destruction. Mm. And I'm very concerned mm. because uh, one thing as a biologist, I'm concerned about uh, the life of our, what I call, uh, co-inhabitants of this earth yes. or co-inhabitants of India and that human beings more and more completely disregard the need of animals and nature and simply go ahead with their immediate needs. Yes. And uh, the problem is that it of course uh, destroys also the environment for human beings. Yeah, that uh, we don't know. Uh, the bad air and yes. all the things. So I'm very concerned about it and I have seen a tremendous change just in 10 years. Um, life has become more comfortable, but the rest is not very good. You are speaking to the choir here because <laughs> we are all <laughs> feeling that. Um, for people like, for the birding community, um, it would be nice for, for us to get your impressions of the para parakeets you see in India and uh, how we should approach them. Yes. Uh, the birder community is uh, really the high point of my visit here. I met many. Um, the birders here are very knowledgeable. They are very dedicated. Um, and I think what they can do based on their knowledge is even more. And um, I very much believe in the concept of citizen science. Uh, I met um, some, uh, I would call, uh, old, but in the good sense, mm. birders that have been observing birds, for instance, in Lalbagh mm. for the last 50 years. Mm. And they have been observing the tremendous change. Mm. So two of them told me that the number of birds in Lalbagh in the last 50 years has declined by 90%. Oh my God. I think that these are very important data because if we tell this to people, then they wake up. Okay, And what I think I would like to encourage birders is to take their knowledge very seriously. You know, if they had kept records carefully by uh, counting birds, for instance, which is relatively simple. You know, every Sunday you go for two hours regularly, you count the birds, you keep a record. Then over time, even in three, four, five years, mm. But then imagine in 50 years, you can really scientifically mm. show mm. that indeed birds have declined by 90%. You can also show how certain bird species are simply not there anymore. Mm. Uh, another thing that citizen science can do is not only observe birds, but as I explained before, look at their behavior. Mm. And um, the important thing is that uh, Indian birders and Indian scientists here will easily be able to do this research every day, every season, every year without interruption. Mm. Somebody like me, mm. I come for two months. Mm. It's long, but it's not sufficient. There are 10 more months where things can be different. Mm. And for that reason, we need Indian scientists and Indian bird watchers to observe birds year round under different seasons and especially now with climate change if we carefully record our observations we will provide an immense service to not only the scientific community but also we have the data to talk to the government mm. and say look we have this data we can prove that the environment is changing drastically that if there are fewer birds it means that the environment is unhealthy mm. and this will also affect people in to the same degree mm. and so data are very important 
um, I heard a talk by, um, and I apologize, I um, always forget his name, um, the what? minister, who you... Jairam Ramesh. <laughs> that's it. He gave a talk at Ararai, and I was just so impressed by him talking. And one of the things that impressed me more, he most, he, he spoke truth to the power. Mm. And he talked to scientists, and he chastised scientists and said, you are not doing your job, because what you need to do is to speak up speak to the government, tell what you know, and not simply observe things and keep records and keep quiet. Mm. You need to be more active. And I couldn't support uh, Minister Ramesh more in that. Um, so mm -hmm. scientists should become activists and active birders should become scientists or citizen and, scientists. And scientists should be birders. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think today with the really critical yeah. uh, environmental destruction and I feel we have about 10 years time mm. before the collapse. Oh my God, that's yes. very dark. I think uh. we need really to speak yes. truth now. And 2050 may not happen. Yeah, oh God. And um, so I think we all have to do everything. Dr. Homburger, <laughs> it has been a privilege having you on the show. Uh, uh, last word on do you have any favorite bird species or parrot species or perhaps you don't that's fine too you know I'm eclectic and I would say I I love all birds it's like I like most people <laughs> 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 you know because I think love and liking and so on is really what gives us uh, the motivation to do good work whatever we do Thank you for being on the show. It is a real privilege to have you. Thank you so much, Shoba. You are a wonderful interviewer. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>